Welcome back, everyone. So as will be familiar from the past two days, this will be the last talk, but not the last event. So we'll have uh, one talk, and then we'll have a panel discussion after that, in which we'll be looking at the ontology of quantum field theory, whether heroically or not. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our last speaker. This is Ben Feinzig, and we'll talk about classical limits of particle concepts in quantum field theory. Take it away, Ben. So sometimes, when I read too much in the philosophy of quantum field theory, I get really depressed. Kind of everyone can be really negative sometimes, I think. It's always about kind of what, what we really want but can't have. And um, yeah, this, this bothers me. And so my, my goal in this talk is just to try to, you know, cheer myself up a little bit. Uh, and, okay, so right, one of the things that people are fond of showing that we can't have in quantum field theory is an interpretation in terms of localizable particles. Okay, see a number of arguments uh, to this effect. There are, I think, at least three problems that come up for particle interpretations. One is whether we can uh, have particles that are localized in regions of space. Another one uh, has to do with having multiple different particle concepts that can't be translated to one another in inequivalent representations. And there are further problems uh, with interactions. Now, um, I'm not gonna talk about interactions at all with apologies to Doreen or anyone else who wanted to talk about them. Um, I just want to focus on these two problems here. Um, now, uh, I think, you know, I, looking at this, right, I mean, you could just kind of draw a negative conclusion and say there aren't any particles in quantum field theory because there are some theorems, right? Um, but clearly there are particles. We see them. They are localized in space. Or we're seeing something, uh, and I think this presents a kind of puzzle. And, okay, there have been a number of attempts to kind of dissolve worries about uh, the appearance of particles, especially the phenomenology of particles. Um, I'm kind of dissatisfied with uh, a lot of those approaches, not because I think that people say things that are wrong, but because they don't succeed in cheering me up. Uh, so, okay, but there's, I think, a kind of promising or uh, intriguing possible solution in an unpublished paper of David Wallace's. So if you go to his website and scroll down, some of you have probably read this paper. As far as I know, it hasn't actually been published anywhere, but it's called The Emergence of Particles from Bosonic Quantum Field Theory. Um, in the paper, okay, as promised, uh, David argues that even though there aren't particles in the theory, we can understand uh, approximately localized particle structures as emergent. I, I, I think that's somewhat helpful. Um, he does this in the non-relativistic approximation, and that's something we've also heard uh, talked about at this conference. Right Earlier this week, I was made aware of uh, other work looking at non-relativistic uh, approximations of quantum field theories and how we might interpret particles in those. Um, I'd like to pursue this kind of theme of thinking about how particle-like concepts might be uh, emergent in some sense. And I wanna try to make precise a sense in which particles could be emergent, or certain aspects of particles at least, could be emergent from quantum field theory. Now, I don't wanna say really anything more about what I mean by emergent. Um, so I'll leave it there. Uh, what I wanna do is uh, use instead of the non-relativistic approximation, I wanna look at the classical limit of quantum field theories. Um, okay, and here's a, a little bit of motivation for that. Um, I don't understand quantum mechanics 
I don't understand really anything, but I think I understand classical theories better than I understand quantum theories. So, okay, well, well then I'll try to understand what's going on in quantum mechanics in terms of things I understand better. Um, I also think, although uh, mentioning this is liable to make people angry, but I think there's some promising work elsewhere uh, in philosophy of physics of using the classical limit or various kinds of classical limits to understand something that might be called emergent behavior in quantum theories, okay, but without committing myself uh, to any of the things that go on uh, in those other papers, I'll just say there, there are suggestions elsewhere that this might be a helpful way of attacking ideas of emergence. Okay, so I wanna use the classical limit, in particular the h bar goes to zero limit, to investigate the localizability of particle concepts, especially number operators in quantum field theories, and then the presence of uh, in equivalent number operators in, in unitarily in equivalent representations. So that's the goal. Um, I should also mention, so a lot of the work that I'm gonna be talking about is really due to a very talented group of undergraduate students who uh, I was lucky enough to uh, get interested in this sort of thing. Um, and this uh, group of students here, so Rory Storyfer, uh, Khalil Gates, Jenna Librande, uh, and Thomas Browning here. Um, they're part of the Washington Experimental Math Lab, which is uh, a program in our math department that uh, basically puts interested math students into uh, research uh, uh, projects. And you can see our experimental apparatus here in the background. Okay, so, um, uh, well, I should say the, the bulk of the technical work, most of like the grunt work of the calculations is due to these folks, but you shouldn't blame them for any of the interpretive things that I'm gonna say today. Uh, I'm to blame for all of that. Okay, so what I wanna do is uh, talk about these problems with particles, the two that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit more detail. I wanna talk about the kinds of technical developments just a little bit um, that need to be overcome in order to analyze the classical limits of things like number operators in quantum field theories. And then I wanna present really just some partial results that we have so far that I think are suggestive of certain interpretations, but they're by no means complete. So this is very much so uh, a work in progress. And some of the things I have written on the slides are not necessarily things that I'm committed to, but are uh, bold statements meant to elicit some reaction. Okay. Okay, so here uh, are gonna be some of these problems that I mentioned uh, before. I just wanna present them in a little bit more detail. So the problem uh, with localizability, I think can be put in, in two ways. Um, really it's the second one that's gonna be most important, but there are theorems that show that no relativistic quantum theory can allow for either position operators or local number operators. What does that mean? Well, okay, here's uh, uh, some conditions under which we would have uh, something that we could call, uh, and I'm not, well, okay. Here is, are at least some necessary conditions for having uh, something like a position operator in a relativistic quantum theory would constitute a localization system, would be a Hilbert space, along with an assignment to spatial sets. So we'll suppose that we've got Minkowski space time and we foliated it into some space like hypersurfaces and we want an assignment to spatial sets of projections. And moreover, we want a continuous representation of at least the translation group uh, of the space time we're gonna be able to interpret these projections here as propositions associated with a particle being located in that particular spatial set. Okay, 
Now, David Malament states a number of conditions that I don't want to go through that we'd hope such a localization system uh, would satisfy, and then proves that if you have a localization system that satisfies those conditions, then it's going to be trivial. Then your particle will be located nowhere at all, because the projection will be zero for all spatial sets. Okay, this is a no-go theorem, right? Because if there were a relativistic position operator, it would need to have non-trivial spectral projections satisfying those conditions, we'd hope. And yet, no such operator can exist. Okay, so what do we say? Well, okay, we don't have position operators in relativistic quantum theories. Instead, we have number operators. So could we associate, instead of uh, these projections instead of position operators, could we associate number operators with local regions of space? Well, such an assignment would be a system of local number operators. We'd still have a Hilbert space. Now, instead of associating projections with spatial sets, we'd associate self adjoint operators that uh, have a discrete spectrum. We'd still want a continuous representation of the translation group. And we take now these operators to represent the number of particles located, right, which might fluctuate in a particular region. OK, again, uh, uh, Hans Halverson and Rob Clifton stated some conditions that we might apply to these systems of local number operators, and then showed that under those conditions, it follows that this assignment of local number operators has to be trivial. Again, this can be interpreted as a no-go theorem because if there were local relativistic number operators, we would want them, in order to have that interpretation, to satisfy the condition stated. And so the conclusion is that no local relativistic number operators can exist. Now, OK, there's a response, one that uh, uh, Halverson and Clifton state themselves, because they realize that this is to some extent incompatible with the phenomenological particle picture. The response is really one due to Buchholz. Okay, well, we can't have local number operators, but we can still have number operators that are almost local. I think, okay, that sounds great, but what does that mean? Well, it gets cached out as there being some other operator that's local that you can approximate in norm with the operator that you've got that's not local. And you say, oh, well, OK, that's the sense in which I call my non-local number operator almost local. And what makes these sorts of almost local operators uh, candidates for a particle interpretation? Well, they don't fall prey to the riesz leader theorem. So they can annihilate the vacuum. This is something that Buchholz harps on. Also, right, uh, Buchholz uses these kinds of operators to develop scattering theory. He says, oh, this is kind of, this is good. This means that we can interpret these things as representing particles somehow. And I think, sure, that's great, but it doesn't cheer me up that much. And the reason is that this seems to me to be a kind of operationalistic description of what we want or, or, or of, of what a particle could be. Right, just reproducing results of scattering experiments and knowing uh, that I'm as close as I want to a local number operator for all states. It's not, it doesn't give me any more understanding of what these almost local operators are or what the local operators are that we use to measure them. So I think that's great, but wouldn't it be great if we could have more? And I think we can't. OK, the other problem I promised to talk about is uh, a problem having to do with inequivalent representations, inequivalent particle representations. OK, so uh, Professor Rucci calls a kind of interpretation of a theory in terms of particles a fundamental particle interpretation. If roughly it gives us a way of labeling 
each state in our theory according to its particle content. You think, well, if I have a Fox space representation in a quantum field theory, then I get something like this if I'm focused on the states in that Fox space representation. Because I have an associated number operator. I've got uh, uh, even number operators associated with varieties of, of particles. And this allows us to decompose my Fox space into subspaces with certain eigenvalues of that number operator. And then I can talk about the particle content of the states that lie in that Fox space. Okay, so that's a kind of primary example uh, of a fundamental particle interpretation. Now, even on our beloved Minkowski space-time, there are multiple Fox space representations, at least if you're focused on the right Rindler wedge. There's the Minkowski representation and the Rindler fulling representation. Some states in the theory we can describe using the Minkowski number operator, which tells us about the Minkowski particle content of those states. Other states we can represent in this Rindler representation, or we can describe them according to the content of the Rindler number operator, according to their Rindler particle content. You think, okay, well, that's not too much of a problem. Sometimes we've got you know, different terms that would be okay, as long as we could translate between these two different ways of talking. Translate between the Rindler and the Minkowski way of describing particle content. Well, Clifton and Halverson, again, argue that a necessary condition for being able to translate between two different particle interpretations, as an example, is a unitary equivalence between the associated Fox space representations. Unitary equivalence is given by an intertwining unitary operator between the Hilbert spaces of the representations. Then, somewhat well known that the Minkowski representation and the Rindler representation fail to be related by such a translation scheme. That is, they are unitarily inequivalent. In fact, the set of states that we can describe by their Minkowski particle content is disjoint from the collection of states that we can describe using their Rindler particle content. And so the conclusion that we ought to draw here is that one cannot give a fundamental particle interpretation, if that's what you wanted, uh, of a quantum field theory in Minkowski spacetime, or really any spacetime with multiple time-like symmetries that generate these unitarily inequivalent representations. And again, there's a response, one that Laura offers. That is, don't give a pristine interpretation, which is the sort of thing that we asked for when we asked for a fundamental particle interpretation, roughly. You can tell me if I'm getting this wrong. But a pristine interpretation would be one that kind of once and for all tells you which states are physically possible. Instead, uh, Laura says, well, sometimes we can restrict attention to the Minkowski representation, and then it looks like we've got a particle interpretation just in terms of the Minkowski number operator. For other purposes, we might have to use other representations. We should allow ourselves to do that. And really, the kind of interpretation that we give isn't going to be fixed once and for all, but instead might be context dependent. And that might be a good thing. Again, I, I agree, and yet it doesn't cheer me up that much. I think this doesn't really give me a better understanding of what Minkowski quanta are, or what Rindler quanta are. And so I just want something more. I want to understand my theory better. I want to understand the particle content of my theory better. And I think the answer to this question is yes. I think our theories, or we should, when we're trying to interpret our theories, try to understand them better to the extent that we can. We may not be able to. But in this case, I, I think that we can gain some understanding of what these different particle concepts are. Okay, so in order to get or 
get to a place where I can uh, wave my hands at some understanding, uh, I have to tell you a little bit about the technical tools that we're going to use to take the h-bar goes to zero limit and look at the emergence uh, of particles. OK, so what I want to do is construct what's called a strict quantization. And I'm going to look just at the case of a real scalar field satisfying the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay. This is going to provide the tool, so all that a strict quantization is. And you know, sometimes when you hear the word quantization, people have kind of visceral reactions to this word. The only thing that's relevant about quantization for my purposes right now is that a strict quantization gives us some really powerful tools for taking the classical limit of a quantum theory. Okay, and I'll tell you a little bit about why I think they're powerful tools. Really, the tools that I want to develop provide us with tools for taking classical limits of free theories, of, of any linear field theory. And the kind of innovation that I think we have here, or one innovation, is that um, We've been able to extend these tools, the tools of strict quantization, which have been well known. But we've been able to extend them somewhat, although in some ways I'll show you it's not totally satisfactory. But we've been able to extend them to cases where we can take classical limits of unbounded quantities. And why is that relevant here? Well, because field operators and number operators are unbounded quantities. They haven't typically been covered by past uh, uh, constructions of strict quantizations. And we have a kind of way of, of describing these classical limits now. OK, here's a strict quantization. It consists in a family of C star algebras indexed by the value of h bar. h bar here is a parameter that's allowed to take values in the interval between 0 and 1. I've got a different C star algebra for each one of these values of h bar. In addition to that, I have things called quantization maps that glue these algebras together. Now, we want to think about each of these algebras as representing the quantities of the theory at the scale defined by that value of h bar. I have a lot more to say about what that means, but I'm not going to say it today because it's a different talk. So we're just thinking that when h bar is greater than 0, we've got a theory that's quantum. The closer it is to 1, the more quantum it is. When I'm at h bar is 0, I've got a classical theory. Now, all that's encoded in these algebras is really the kind of kinematical structure of the theory. I've got quantities, and I'm able to define states. Now I need to do something else. This is something is given by these quantization maps. What they do is they identify what counts as the same quantity in the theories at different scales, at different values of h bar. So the quantization maps formally are maps from this first classical algebra into these other algebras. And I identify what's the same observable. Is it position, right, for each one of these other algebras that I'm looking at? I should say also, when we start with C star algebras, that means we're restricting ourselves to bounded quantities. And we have to do that basically in order to state these limiting conditions, the conditions of approximation here. So that's important. OK, what are the approximations that we get? Well, when I'm able to talk about Poisson brackets, that's the sufficiently smooth part here. It's just whenever the Poisson bracket is well defined, basically. Then I have that the h bar scaled commutator between any two quantities approximates that Poisson bracket. Then I have that the product in my quantum theory approximates the product in my classical theory. And lastly, that the norms of my quantities approximate each other in the limit as h bar goes to 0. OK. These are pretty strong, actually. The fact that uh, these are limits of norm differences means that these approximations are going to hold uniformly for all states. And that's good. I think that's basically, without getting too much into it, uh, the feature that allows us to interpret this as a kind of classical limit that allows us to recover the theoretical content of the quantum theory. 
Okay, so here's our picture of a strict quantization. I've got my family of algebras, one for each value of h bar. I've got a bunch of quantization maps, again, one for each value uh, of h bar, taking me from that classical algebra and defining a section that I can think of as being the classical limit of the same quantity in all of these different algebras. Okay, so then to set up one of these strict quantizations, I'm going to start by telling you the classical theory that I'm considering, the mathematical framework that I'm going to be thinking about it with. It's the classical Klein-Gordon theory with mass m. And to set up my theory, I'm going to consider the real vector space, it's a real scalar field, of initial data for the Klein-Gordon equation on some time slice. That is, I'm going to be thinking about pairs of fields defined on a time slice uh, and their conjugate momentum. Now, we can understand the space of definite classical field configurations or initial data for field configurations as a subspace of the dual to, as we've heard so much about already, right, this is really important that we think of these things as distributions that are uh, uh, dual to the space of test functions. Okay, so that's gonna be my space E here. Space of test functions for both my uh, field configurations and my field momentum. So that's why we've got two of them here. Um, and I'll just make a note now that I'm gonna, when I'm considering the pairs, use lowercase f and g, and then I think the way I finally did it later is I'm eventually gonna use just a capital F to denote the, the entire pair. So there's nothing funny going on there. Capital letters denote pairs of lowercase letters. Okay, on the space of test functions, I have a symplectic form defined. The symplectic form is necessary for having a Hamiltonian formulation of the theory. That symplectic form also allows me to define the algebras that represent the quantum version of this theory. That symplectic form defines a twist in the multiplication operation right here that defines the canonical commutation relation. Okay, so my quantum theory then is gonna be given by, for each value of h bar, the Weyl algebra where this twist is given by h bar times that symplectic form sigma. This algebra is generated by elements. Okay, I'm gonna call them W sub h bar and I've got one of those elements for each pair of test functions in that space uh, of test functions with compact support. By telling you these two relations, I fixed everything there is to know about the algebra. It turns out that these elements have to be linearly independent. Here defined for you the involution operation and then the multiplication operation. And then there's actually a unique norm that you can put on this collection to make it into a C star algebra. Okay. Now, um, in order to define the quantization maps, that's what's, what's left to do. Um, I'm gonna suppose that we have what's called a complex structure on my space E of pairs of test functions. In general, there are gonna be many of these. It actually turns out it doesn't matter which one we pick for now. A complex structure is a linear map that satisfies these three conditions here. Having a complex structure allows me to define uh, a complex inner product on my initial space of test functions, that is. This is oftentimes a useful construction for cons uh, uh, providing us with a one particle Hilbert space. And then you use that one particle Hilbert space to produce a Fox space representation. Now, one of the themes that I wanna emphasize is that I'm not gonna work in a particular representation. So I'm not gonna define a Fox space from this, and that's gonna be important. And that's why it doesn't matter, uh, or I'll say in a second why it doesn't matter which complex structure you actually choose. Okay, so to pick your favorite complex structure, define a map uh, from the classical Weyl algebra, which is just the one that we get, but plugging in h bar equals zero, that's gonna give me a commutative algebra. Uh, 
I'm going to define a map from that commutative algebra into each one of these non-commutative algebras for the positive values of h bar. This map uh, inherently involves this complex inner product that I've just defined from a choice of j. It turns out that all choices of j lead to the same classical limit. That is, uh, all of the quantizations that I define this way for different choices of j are what Klaus Landsman calls equivalent quantizations, just meaning the limits of the differences between those quantizations go to zero in norm as h bar goes to zero. Okay, now, um, this theorem here is a corollary of something proved by these guys, Honegger and Rieker, mathematical physicists, that show that a certain class of quantization maps uh, that happens to include this one form strict quantizations according to the previous definition that I put up. That's really nice. Why did I pick this one in particular if there's a class of strict quantizations that I could use that they've established? Well, it turns out that this one has some nice properties. When you're working in a system whose phase space is finite dimensional, a finite dimensional vector space, this map actually corresponds to what's called the Berezin quantization. But if you look at the Berezin quantization in a theory with finitely many degrees of freedom, it doesn't look so nice. It's written down in terms of integrals uh, with respect to coherent states. It looks, or it may look, as though in order to write it down, you need a measure defined on your phase space, which when we're working in field theories, which have infinitely many degrees of freedom and their phase space is infinite dimensional, usually there's no nice measure that we would want to choose that could play that role. So it's actually nice here that we get that we don't need a measure in order to define this quantization map like you might have thought. Instead, we can define the Berezin quantization map in a purely algebraic way. Okay, so that's one development already. Now, one of the nice features of the Berezin quantization map for finite dimensional systems is that it has this nice property called positivity, which implies that it's continuous in the norm topology. It turns out that this property extends to infinite dimensions. So it extends to field theoretic systems like the ones that I'm considering here. I thought this was like kind of miraculous, actually. And what this does is it implies, because these maps are continuous, that there's a unique way to extend them to the completions of the algebras that I'm looking at in the weak topology. Now, C star algebras are always complete in their norm topology, but the weak topology is much coarser. And when you complete in the weak topology, you get something that's much, much bigger and typically unruly. Uh, what you get in this case, well, first of all, I'll say, you get algebras that contain things that we would associate with unbounded operators. And that's what I'm looking for. So that's why I want to do this. That's why uh, I'm harping on certain technical features of this quantization map. But you can extend the quantization map to unbounded operators. When you do so, these completed algebras that you get, um, they're no longer algebras, actually. Uh, there's a zoo of different kinds of uh, algebras that you can get by completing in this way. Some of them, if you use, for example, the weak topology, you're not going to be able to multiply any two elements that you choose. And this kind of corresponds, if you're used to dealing with unbounded operators, to having issues with domains of definition on a Hilbert space, except that I'm able to say this without having a Hilbert space representation at all. OK, so these are partial star algebras. I can't always uh, multiply elements, but, but that's going to be OK, uh, because I can sometimes multiply elements together. Um, and I should say also that one of the reasons I care so much about being able to do this in a representation independent way is because I want to take the classical limits of operators that live in different representations, like the Minkowski number operator and the Rindler number operator. So it's important that I'm able to do that. OK, now we need to uh, make sure that when I complete my algebra in this way, uh, I get at least the field operators and the number operators that I want to take the classical limit of so badly. 
Uh, you can define those from the Weyl algebras uh, by this limiting formula. If we knew that these were Cauchy nets, then we know that they have a limit in this completed algebra. Um, we don't for the Weyl algebra, it turns out, but we can construct another algebra from the Weyl algebra that contains the Weyl algebra. Uh, so this is gonna be a, 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 an algebra that's a W star algebra in which the Weyl algebra for each possible value of H bar uh, is dense in the weak star topology. Um, and this algebra, um, which, okay, so here's the construction of it, which isn't gonna be important, but this algebra contains the polynomials of all of our fields. So this is gonna contain fields, creation annihilation operators, and number operators. And I don't need to take a Hilbert space representation to define those. Okay, once I've got these, I can take my Berezin quantization map, which I've defined for my infinite dimensional system, and extend it to these algebras, and then I know it's gonna be well-defined on my field operators, creation annihilation operators, and number operators. Okay. So first, I'll say um, that something about the kind of notion of approximation that you get in the limit as h bar goes to zero here. Because this quantization map is positive, that allows me to pull back any state on one of the algebras for a value of h bar greater than zero and define that same state on all of the algebras that we're looking at. So I can define a kind of constant uh, field of uh, states in this way. And then I can use those constant fields of states as a kind of standard by which I can compare operators and see how good this approximation is. And so what you get is that for each uh, uh, constant collection of states that I define in this way, the products uh, uh, of my observables approximate the classical product uh, uh, within epsilon for any epsilon that that you choose, as long as h bar is, is small enough. Um, this is okay. It's not as good of a notion of approximation as I had in the definition of a strict quantization, because this involves an approximation for each state, rather than one of these norm approximations that uniformly bounds these differences for all states. Um, so I think it's an open question. I'd really like to have a better notion of approximation here. Um, and you might try to get one. Okay, so here's an idea. Uh, I, the reason I have to go to states is because I completed in the weak topology, which is defined uh, by appeal to these states, and I have to treat them one at a time. So the question is, could I just have used a better topology? that's finer than the weak topology, although not as fine as the norm topology, could I have done that in such a way to, to, to get an approximation that's better? And I have an idea of how to go about doing it, but I, I won't harp on it. Um, I think it's enough. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more later about how the approximation is, is better than it might at this point appear. Okay, that's the annoyingly technical part of the talk. Okay, so now I just wanna present, again, some really partial results about what you can do using this framework for taking classical limits of unbounded quantities in free field theories. Um, what I wanna argue is that these tools at least help us start to analyze, uh, uh, maybe I should have put scare quotes around emergent particle behavior here. Okay, now, um, each of our number operators and creation annihilation operators are going to be, be defined not by choosing a particular Fox space representation, because I want to do this in a representation independent way, but actually they can be completely determined just by a choice of complex structure, those things that I mentioned earlier. Now, it doesn't matter if you choose the same complex structure that you had in the quantization map or something different. So let's just suppose like we fixed in the quantization map some kind of neutral complex structure that doesn't discriminate between the Minkowski and the Rindler representation, something else altogether. It doesn't matter what it was. Now choose either the Minkowski or the Rindler complex structure and define the uh, Minkowski and the Rindler number operators accordingly. Um, this here is a standard definition. Uh, this here is a standard definition. 
Now, when people talk about taking uh, the total number operator, uh, one of the things that they'll have you do is uh, think about these number operators here as uh, the number of particles in the state with wave function described by this thing here. There's a kind of tricky uh, equivocation going on, I think, between thinking about these things as test functions, and then all of a sudden, when you're working in a Fox space representation, you're tempted to take them to be wave functions. Um, I'm not sure that that's a good move. Uh, so I, I won't say much more about that, except to notice that my definition here of the total number operator is actually non-standard. I'm taking the sum not over a basis of uh, wave functions for the entire space, but uh, I'm just fixing uh, uh, not uh, a basis, any Fox space representation, but an L2 basis uh, uh, for the first element here. It might come up later if we have time, but it might not. Um, okay, so we've got enough structure to define these number operators, both the Minkowski one and the Rindler one, independent of a Fox space representation of the Weyl algebra. So I think this framework is appropriate for comparing the classical limits of these different number operators. Remember the challenge uh, from Ritchie was that these number operators would be incommensurable, that because we don't have a unitary equivalence, we can't compare them. Well, here's a framework in which we actually have the possibility of comparing them. Let's see if we can do it. Okay, um, choose your favorite number operator. What's its classical limit? It turns out that its classical limit is just the thing that's defined in the classical Weyl algebra, sorry, in the extension to the classical Weyl algebra that I'm considering, with the same exact form, the same exact functional form defined from the field operators, which are defined from the Weyl operators. It turns out, and here's, you can see, this is actually a much better approximation than I had in general for these extended uh, uh, quantization maps to unbounded quantities, because the difference between the number operator that you're choosing uh, in the quantum theory and the classical number operator is actually a bounded operator itself up here. So it's a multiple of the identity. Um, and it's proportional to h bar, which means as h bar goes to zero, uh, in norm that's gonna approach, that difference is gonna approach zero. So somehow, miraculously, we get a much better approximation for this particular uh, difference here. What do I think we should conclude? I think we should conclude that these operators in the classical theory should be understood as the classical limits of these number operators. This result's gonna hold for any choice of J. So this applies to both the Minkowski oper uh, number operator and the Rindler number operator. I haven't defined the J's corresponding to those things yet. And this is gonna hold regardless of whether either of those J's is the one that I use to define my quantization map. Again, I think, uh, you know, this is, like I said, a pretty nice notion of approximation, um, but it doesn't tell me anything about products or commutators involving the number operator and other operators that we might compare it to. Um, Right, the way I said we got a better approximation is by knowing that this difference is a bounded operator itself. Um, so we might look to see if other uh, differences of products are also bounded operators. I don't know how to do this in general, but I can do it for lots of cases uh, that I care about uh, involving number operators, fields, and creation annihilation operators. Okay, but it would be nice to be able to say something much stronger about the notion of approximation that we have here uh, in general, and I don't know how to say that. But I think this is kind of okay for now. Okay, so let me define for you now, finally, at long last, uh, the Minkowski number operator. I told you all I have to do is fix a particular choice of complex structure, J. I don't have to choose a representation. Here's my choice of J. I first define uh, uh, this differential operator, mu, on my space of test functions. And then I define J the amuse action on pairs of test functions. Once I do that, I fix the definition of the Minkowski number operator 
And the results that I've just presented you allow us to look at its classical limit. They tell you, us that its classical limit exists, and we know it takes the form of one of these n zeros in my algebra of classical observables. So you might ask, what does the classical limit of the Minkowski number operator look like? And perhaps unsurprisingly, it's something that should be very familiar. So first of all, let me tell you that these classical uh, 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 quantities in the classical vial algebra have a kind of uh, canonical, maybe canonical is too strong. They have a representation as functions on my classical phase space that assign to each field configuration and conjugate field momentum some complex number by this exponential function here, where I've smeared with my test functions uh, upstairs. Um, well, if I look at that same representation, say, OK, it makes sense. Classical observables are functions that assign values to points in phase space. What does my classical number operator look like uh, in that representation? It takes this form. That is, it looks like the integral of the energy density of the Klein-Gordon field over all of space. It looks like the total energy. And that's for the total number operator, of course. And of course, you're going to need some technical restrictions to make sure that this integral uh, converges. But when it does, uh, then you have this identity. OK, so the classical limit of the Minkowski number operator is the classical total energy of the Klein-Gordon field. I think this is pretty nice. I think what this tells us is that the Minkowski number operator behaves approximately on certain scales, like the classical total energy. And that classical total energy, remember, OK, to come back now to the problems that motivated uh, my worries in the first place, the problem was that particles can't be localized in quantum field theories. This classical total energy or classical energy is local in the sense that it has an associated energy density. This thing right here, it gets assigned to points of space. Right? That energy density, again, can be thought of right, as a component of the classical energy momentum tensor. So there's a pretty strong sense in which that thing is a local object in the classical theory. And in fact, you can define in the classical theory what might look like an analog of a system of local number operators by integrating that energy density over regions of space. So okay, I'm going to skip this parenthetical. I can come back to it if someone has a question. It's about the caveat that I made before about the somewhat non-standard way in which I define the total number operator. Um, I think this tells us that there's a sense in which the number operator is approximately local. It looks approximately on certain scales, like this other quantity that we know about, the classical energy. And that quantity is a local quantity. OK, but we already knew from Buchholz, right, that number operators were almost local. So what have I added here? I'll just say again basically what I said before. Um, I think Buchholz really only gives us a kind of operationalistic understanding of what these number operators are. And OK, this is one of the uh, claims that's meant to be evocative. Um, that I think looking at the classical limit here helps us understand localization as part of the theoretical content of these number operators. I think it goes beyond its phenomenological or operationalistic uh, interpretation. Um, I'll also mention, um, just very quickly, um, this is why these are partial results. You can define uh, the Rindler number operator if you restrict your space of test functions to the right Rindler wedge. How do you do it? You define a different j by choosing a different differential operator mu. That gives you a different number operator. With this j, the results I've presented to you already tell us that uh, the classical limit of the Rindler number operator exists. You get a certain form for it. I haven't put that form up here because it's, I don't have a very nice way of uh, describing it yet. I think what it is is uh, that it's the classical conserved quantity associated with uh, the time-like symmetries of Lorentz boost on the Rindler wedge. Um, but a little bit more work is, is needed here. Um, but 
Okay, uh, the question is, how does this classical limit of the Rindler number operator now, because we've got a framework for comparing it to the other number operators, how does it compare to um, the classical energy? That's the classical limit of the Minkowski number operator. And by looking at those, do we want to decide uh, contra Rushi that these things are commensurable in some sense? So that's the, the, the open question, I think, here for uh, comparing these inequivalent number operators. I, I think it's very clear, at least, that there are different quantities associated with the field. They're not meant to be the same quantity, in the classical limit, at least. Ah, yeah, and one final uh, remark to wrap up here, which uh, I was hoping that Porter would still be here so that I can make a slight jab at him. But luckily, uh, Laura is still here, so I can make a jab at her. Uh, so, okay, my approach to interpretation here, I would call, uh, well, when I say make a job, I should say agree strongly with, uh, is another way of putting it. Um, it's non-standard. What do I mean by that? Well, Porter describes a notion of non-standard interpretation uh, in a somewhat re recent paper. He says, look, there's a standard notion that philosophers have to interpret theories by considering them in a very isolated context, just taking their mathematical structure and looking at it without comparing it to other things around it. And he says that's a bad thing. I agree, that's a bad thing. I think we should look to relations between our theories to inform our understanding, especially of the things that we're puzzled about in quantum theories. Um, this is very closely related, I think, although maybe it doesn't line up exactly uh, with what Laura has called adulterated interpretation, which is supposed to be in contrast to pristine interpretation, that again does this thing of taking a theory and saying once and for all what the possible worlds are according to that theory. That's, I think, pretty clearly not what I'm doing here. Because again, the theorems from Malaman and from Halverson and Clifton uh, show that there's no local number operator to be found in the quantum theory. But that's not where I'm finding. Um, now, but one difference that, ha that there is between uh, me and maybe Porter and Laura uh, is that unlike them, I think that we can give these kinds of interpretations, looking at the relations between one theory and another, even looking at approximations, um, without giving up on uh, either mathematical rigor, which is something that Porter seems to associate uh, with standard interpretations, although I'm not sure he would say there's a necessary connection. Uh, but but it's, he associates giving up uh, on standard interpretation with giving up on mathematical rigor. I don't want to do that, and I don't think you have to. Um, one of Laura's arguments that we should give up on pristine interpretation um, is actually an argument that we should give up on using algebraic methods once and for all, and instead that we'll sometimes have to use Hilbert space representations in quantum theories. I also don't think we have to do that, at least in the case that I've looked at here. We can look at classical limits of number operators and gain some understanding, I think, kind of give some interpretation by purely algebraic methods. So I, my very small remark here is just that I think we can separate uh, some of these issues out. They're not necessarily connected uh, with one another. I'll end there, thank you. Um, <coughs> so these classical limits of number operators, I think you wanted to call them classical number operators, but in what sense are they number operators at all? Because one of the conditions that, that um, Halverson and Clifton had is that they, the number operators have this free spectrum. Mm -hmm. And it seems like what we're going here with the dialect is we start with a classical theory, a classical field theory, we quantize it, and then usually when people start talking about particle content, it's because certain quantities are have, disc have discrete sp spectra and there's things that we can count. And then when we go backwards to the classical limit, unsurprisingly we get a, a field theory back, but then it seems like, like we've lost all talk of particles because there aren't discrete things that we can count. I completely agree. Classical energy is not discrete, and yet there is a sense in which my discrete quantum 
quantities behave on certain scales approximately like the classical energy. So that's my only thing. But I agree. This, <laughs> these aren't particles in that sense. It's just uh, uh, what particles look like approximately on certain scales. Or collections. And the scales being ones where the differences between energy levels are, are negative. So I get that. I, I, yeah. So if I, if I, if I, if I, I'm operating on a coarse grain scale where I, I ignore the discreteness of the energy spectrum, that it's as if I have a continuous energy spectrum. That's right. And so you can't explain, I guess, why particles are discrete in the classical limit, but you can't explain why they appear to be local in some sense. Two questions. Um, the first one is, uh, <clears throat> um, if, if I think of these um, constructions as uh, a one parameter family of theories in which you have parameter h bar, right? Uh, when you make it very small, you make it very, small, very small compared to what scale h bar has dimensions. So what is the, what are you comparing it with to do that? That's number one. And number two, uh, can you get objects like the two-point functions? Can you get the correlator? Can you get Weinman functions in this one parametric family? Because if you can, I have things to talk to you about that would be super interesting. For example, studying what happens with the uh, entanglement structure of the theory, of almost like the ground state of the theory, as you take the classical limit. Of course, it would disappear, but I don't know how. Uh, uh, there are very interesting questions one can ask if it's computable, let's say. If you have expressions or approximations or even bounds on what the two-point correlators would be. But I'm also interested in the first one. So yeah. two questions to you. Uh, well, I'll answer the second one first, though. Uh, I should have some things to say, but I don't have. We can figure it out. Okay, we should talk. Uh, the to the first question, um, which is somewhat more complicated, and to the thing that I said would take me a whole another talk. Uh, so I think it's a myth in the physics community that in order to take the limit of a parameter, it has to be dimensionless. Mm. And uh, you think it's a myth? Yeah. So so here's. The very, very rough sketch without, uh, uh, I, we, we can talk about this later, but of, of what it means for me to take the limit as h bar goes to zero, how I want to interpret it. Um, what we're doing uh, when we're changing the value of h bar is we're really changing our system of units in which we represent the numerical value of h bar. And of course, your first reaction is uh, changing units can't change what's going on physically at all. Indeed, it does not. But it changes in my uh, strict quantization. It changes uh, when I change units. Uh, how do I go back very far? Um, it changes which operator I choose to represent the same physical quantity. Um, so, so in this algebra, because h bar takes on one value, I'm going to choose an operator with a certain spectrum to represent that quantity. Here, I'm going to choose a different operator because I changed units. And it turns out when you do that construction, this, this limit is well defined. And what it tells you is that for the choice of units that you want to work in, and for any quantities that you're looking at, these operator products and commutators uh, are going to approximate uh, the Poisson bracket and the product of the classical theory within some error bound. That error bound being determined by the system of units that you fed in. But there's always going to be some error bound with which these differences uh, are uh, uh, uniformly within epsilon. Okay. So oh, yeah. that, that, that is fine. The second bit is fine with me. I think I understand. Uh, as in, like, the way I understand, okay, I fix a numerical value of the scale and I start changing units. That's fine with me. You're making the constant smaller effectively. So you are doing a physical change, not just a change of units. Right? But you say, no, h bar is what it is. But I'm effectively changing the units in what is seven, whatever. You know what I mean? If something is seven and I start varying the units, I'm varying the constant value of the constant. I don't have any problem with that. I do have an issue with your first claim. That you think that to take limits of things being very small, um, you need to do it on dimensionless things. You don't need, you said you don't need to do it. On yeah, because H bar has to have dimensions for the interpretation that I just gave, yeah. but I'm saying what you might end up doing is basically changing units into a system where h bar is very, very small in order to approximate with an epsilon. And then if you change units back to where h bar was the value that you wanted, to the units that you wanted, the epsilon, right, your error bound, uh, is going to be very, very, very large. No, I don't even have 
epsilon on this slide, but it's encoded in these so letters. If you tell me that you have a quantity that has units and that quantity is very small, I would say I don't understand what that means because I can change units and make it big. You know what I mean? You could, and when you change units, the error bound that you allow in this approximation scheme is going to get much, much bigger. Right, right. No, I am. So let me say one more thing and I stop. I'm okay with what you're doing here, now that I understand what you're doing here. I'm not okay with the claim that is a myth. See what I mean? Like, when I say that, the, say to see something is relativistic, the velocity is large. If I don't have a scale C, I don't know what that means. See what I mean? Uh, yes, all I'm saying is that the numerical value of each bar is yes. small. Yeah. And that is fine, but then again, uh, it's, I think there are two different things. So when, I, when, I, when I take limits of things being very, very small, I don't mean that usefully. And that is, you're actually saying, no, I'm taking a limit where h is very small according to some fiducial scale that I have here. And I'm reducing that fiducial scale, which is equivalent to changing units and keeping this numerical value constant. So there is a scale, the original scale of h bar, for example, in a given set of units. The one in your interval is the fiducial scale. Sure. I'm also happy with that. Okay. <laughs> okay, Laura? Can I try a quick question and just have a quick answer or say something about the commensurability? Um, the, the quick question is about the um, niceness you need to impose on pi and phi to get the energy density to converge. Is there a way to transfer that back through the strict quantization apparatus, the, a kind of restriction on something in the quantum theory, or is that just sort of... Um, it's hard for me to think about that because yeah. phi and pi are right, the determinate classical yeah. fields. Um, so they're not like the field yeah. operators. The field operators yeah. would be, where am I here? The field yeah. operators would be functions that take in these things and spit out, say, the value of yeah. this thing out or smeared in a region. Um, what they essentially what they need to do is they need to vanish uh, fast enough at infinity that uh, when you apply the divergence theorem in the calculation, the surface terms are zero. So, so it's like really a technical thing, but but think about it, like pi and phi have to go to zero in order for this integral to be well defined. So I think of it that way, and I. Um, yeah, and that's, that's about all I want to say about it. I think that, that matters. It's, that it's just a way of saying we've restricted ourselves to a space on the face space where we can make sense of this and then kind of extend it. It's just harder to make sense of. Was there a second part to the question? No, the first time I'll come back to you. Oh, okay. Uh, Noel? Um, so yes, yeah, so I think we resolved are really quick. Cool. And I think they can contribute to our understanding of the localization. Did you speak that? Sorry. So I think these results are really cool, and I think they can contribute to our understanding of localization. But I guess I have kind of a similar worry to Wayne, which is that there seem to be other cases where we're clearly not talking about the energy density. We're talking about something that's almost local, and we're measuring particles. And so I want to understand what we're doing when we do that in the lab. And so I guess so this is this is a preamble by way of saying I want to push back a bit on the the, the Google's talk about almost local quantities being too operationalist, because I think the way that he presents it and the way that, that Hans and Rob present it make it sound super operational, but you can sort of turn on its head that it looks a lot less operational. So they focus on the things that you're, the local, the compactly localized things that you're, you're, you're using to approximate this uh, almost local thing. But you could start from the quasi-local algebra and smear operators there with test functions that vanish pretty fast, exponentially or whatever, but not fast enough to be compactly localized. Those are the, that's when, they, when he originally introduces them, those are the, the almost local operators. And then you show that those things you can approximate by suitable, actually local operators. So for that angle, it looks like you've already got this thing in your theory, these operators that aren't sort of nice enough to, to actually be in the local algebra but they're still associated with the region because they've got this nice snaring function. And then what you're doing is, when you make local measurements, you're actually approximating those things, something like that. So it seems like already at the quantum level, you have a kind of story about almost localization. Yeah, I'm, I, I think that's fine. That, that, that's actually great. I think that yeah, just I think it's more, more good news to the idea more. that we can start to make 
better sense yeah. of, yeah. I, I guess, guess in that case, you know, and we can talk about this later, I would just ask about what do those operators look like in the quantum theory, and is there a way of making sense of them there? Uh, I, I'm kind of still tempted to say, like, this helps me, and I hope that this somehow relates yeah, to I mean, those it's, operators. It's from, from what I remember, it's literally, like, the total number operator, but, like, smeared with this test function so that it's going to be associated with some region where it's heightened. Laura wants to jump in. Yeah, so you cited the paper by Arios and Sergio, um, and I don't remember how it works, but I remember feeling like it had a pretty good argument that the Buchholz almost local operators were not used some um, relativistic badness to um, well, it. Are you saying you, you're not impressed by that argument? Or? Um, well, the property that they, they show basically that the almost local not, uh, operators don't have the properties that we would associate with local number operators. That they don't have, I, I think it's, they, they don't satisfy something like microsoft causality or, yeah. um, and that, you know, I have to look at the details, but uh, I, I guess I don't want to rely on that to push back because I don't, I don't think I at least want to take a stance with them as disagreeing with, yeah. with Buchholz. I'm just, I think I, Could you say a little bit more about the mathematical status of these local number operators related to the Riesleder theorem and all of this? Um, because in the case of the non-relativistic limit, we were actually hoping that at least in the limit we should be able to define such a thing, but then realized that somehow it would fail, like the annihilation operators would fail to annihilate the global vacuum for a reason. So up to how, like, uh, yeah, maybe I just don't understand where these operators lead in some sense. Yes, so why they, Riesleder would fail to apply or something like this? Um, well, there are signatures of Riesleder here. As well as it, these operators live in an abstract, not even a star algebra, but a partial star algebra. So they don't even have a Hilbert space representation. Okay, you don't, you don't need one to think about that. Now, okay, let me, uh, where does Riesleder uh, come in? It can come in even in the classical theory in some sense. Uh, so I said, like, these would be the natural uh, way of defining local classical number operators by looking at energy density integrated over a local region. Okay, now, um, I just want to point out that this looks very different, and I'll, I'll, this will connect with Reach Leader, I promise. Uh, 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 this actually looks very different from the way that people try to define local number operators in a Fox space. So one thing that's sometimes done is you look at a subspace of test functions that have support, uh, where both the test functions, remember these are pairs of test functions, you get pairs that have support contained in, in the region delta. And then you take that space, okay, so S delta, the space of test functions that have that support, um, and you look, especially uh, right, if you're working in a Fox space, you say something like, oh, these are the wave functions for, for particles localized there. Then you take the sum over an orthonormal basis of those wave functions in that Fox space. So that's when I say alpha j orthonormal. That's the uh, uh, inner product that gets used in the Fox space. Um, so you take the sum of number operators over uh, the one particle wave functions that are localized in delta. If you do that in the quantum theory, then for any delta, no matter how small, when you take that sum, you're going to get the global number operator. That's a signature of the Riesleder theorem. Now, if you did that in your classical theory, even if you sum up your uh, 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 what look like uh, uh, your number operator smear, but you sum them up over a basis of wave functions, so orthonormal with respect to alpha j. Um, you would actually basically get the same thing. You would get a global quantity. So that thing is not equal to this thing that I'm defining as a local number operator. And I, I would say that's a kind of signature of the, it's, it's not exactly uh, uh, equivalent to the Riesleder theorem, but it's a consequence of it. Uh, and, and that happens even uh, in this theory. And that's why uh, previously, so when, I'm glad that you asked this because I got to talk about that parenthetical, um, but that's why over here, I chose not a basis of wave functions in the Fox space, but instead uh, I said, you're only looking at uh, essentially smearing the first part. You're only looking at smearing the field, not the 
really the momentum, not the feel part, but it doesn't matter as long as it's just one of them. Um, with respect to the L2 uh, inner product, which is not the inner product in the Fox space. In fact, this is a real inner product on a real vector space. So I'm not taking a sum over wave function states. I think this is actually one of the ways in which thinking about this in relation to the riesz leader theorem can help us kind of inform our understanding of what we're doing when we're summing these number operators in the quantum theory, because we're not doing what we thought we were. Okay, back to commensurability. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so commensurability and commensurability, I think that was like Bob and Hans's central yeah. thing. Like, my hang up was really, and again, it was targeted at the idea that a single particle notion could do it all. My hang up was that any particle notion affiliated with the Fox space would fail to discriminate between theoretically six states from wholly outside that Fox space. So I'm going to war with just the Minkowski particle number operator and its type number operators. All of the states in the Foley and the render representation are going to like look the same with respect to particle content to me. Um, and I, I, I hope you're cheered up. But um, exactly the kind of comparability you're going to get out of that will elevate either the particle notions you're comparing to the sort of full coverage. That's a kind of high mark to aim for. Um, yeah. yeah I guess I'll, I'll agree that you don't have full coverage. I guess one thing I would say is that I don't expect um, this thing to fully cover in the sense of completely label all my states. I'm going to have lots of states with the same energy. Uh, and so if I think, oh, well, this is just another variable that's telling me something about the field, but not everything, then I get less worried. Or, or maybe I don't want this. I'm not so concerned about whether this quantity gives me a complete labeling of, of all my states. So this quantity and its friends on the committee, the number To completely determine the me, uh, I, do, I don't know. That's a good question. The quantum analog is from the average that I thought. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Okay, well, let's thank them.